I'm Catherine Arndt, the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. Welcome to today's episode, brought to you by the VLGA, your councillor support network and the national broadcaster on all things local government. Hello everyone and welcome to the last of our VLGA Connect LGIU Global Executive Panels for 2023 on the topic of community engagement done well. I'm your host for the session this evening. My name is Chris Eddy and it's uh, lovely to have you with us. We're expecting uh, a reasonably large group of people from both in Australia and in the UK for this session. Before I introduce our panellists and uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. Firstly, the VLGA acknowledges the traditional owners of country throughout Victoria and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the traditional owners, their elders past, present and future and to their cultures. I'm personally coming to you from the land of the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation. Before I introduce our panellists, we would like to tell you a little bit about LGBT. GIU and the VLGA. And firstly, I'm going to call on Heather Yedegaroff, who's the Chief Operating Officer with the Local Government Information Unit. It's good morning to you, Heather. Good morning and good evening. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for the introduction, Chris. As you said, I'm Heather Yedegaroff from the LGIU. At the LGIU, we believe that the most innovative and effective answers to global challenges that we all face are coming from local governments around the world. But when you work in local government, finding the time to connect with what colleagues in other countries are doing is never easy. And that's what today is all about. So it's our great honour to once again bring you practical insights and ideas from senior executives and local authority experts from all over the world. And this is now the third year that we've been running these global local executive panels for the VLGA and LGIU communities. So before we hand over to our speakers for today's discussion, I'd just like to say good morning again to our LGIU members who are joining us from across the UK and also good evening to our colleagues in Australia. It's really good to see you all again. For those of you who don't know us, we are the UK's biggest independent local government membership body. We were created by three councils in England 40 years ago this year. And today, more than 300 councils from across the UK, Ireland and Australia are supported by our full membership benefits. And LGIU, we believe in local democracy and we know that local democracy exists because of people like you. And we believe that democratic local governments are the foundation of places where we all live and work. And this is down to the work that you're doing in your communities and councils every day. We believe that local government raises places up, designs and delivers the most appropriate public services and helps communities and individuals to thrive. And so our purpose is to support you every day of the work you do. We're here to make sure that you're engaged, informed and connected. We do our best for you so that you can do your best for your community. So really hope you enjoy this panel. Thank you for everything that you do to support local democracy around the world. And thank you for the introduction. With that, I'm going to pass back to you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks very much, Heather. And it's 7.35 in the morning there for you, am I right? It's 7.35 and the sun is shining where I am, I'm pleased to say. Lovely. Uh, it also might explain why a few more people are yet to join us. It's uh, very early for our UK guests. I'm not sure what the excuse for the Australian people are unless they're on Optus. I think the Optus problem is solved anyway. But uh, thank you, Heather, for those few words about LGIU. Let's talk a bit about the VLGA. I must apologise on behalf of Catherine Arndt, the CEO of the VLGA, who did want to be with us. I think uh, Catherine, unfortunately, has been delayed and may join us in a little while. But uh, I will take up the task of telling you about the work of the VLGA, which supports councils and councillors to deliver great outcomes for their local communities through high performance and good governance. It's member-run and non-partisan and aims to provide practical advice, direct support, training, professional development, events, networks and resources to members and to carry out research, policy analysis and advocacy on behalf of of local councils. The VLGA is a leading voice for local councils and offers members the opportunity to realise their true leadership potential and increase their impact. The mission of the VLGA is to inspire and enable good governance in councils. And here's just a look at some of the events that are coming up to round out the year. It's not too late to sign up, so put these 
in your little black book. Tomorrow, we'll be presenting the second in our housing webinar series. This is looking at the short stay accommodation tax and whether that will be a solution to Victoria's rental housing crisis, or is it more of a tourism dilemma? Our panellists include Felicia Mariani, the CEO of the Victorian Tourism Industry Council, Councillor Brian Hood, the Mayor of Hepburn Shire Council, and Rachel Hornsby, founder and director of Hornsby & Co. We're going to discuss the proposed introduction of a 7.5% tax on short-stay accommodation and its potential effect on Victoria's tourism sector and what councils can expect, particularly those who rely on the economic benefit of tourism. Then on the 24th of November, the housing series continues with a discussion on what is not just an issue in Victoria, but many places in Australia and around the world. And that is how do we provide enough housing for key workers in Victorian towns and cities? And for the councillors who've joined us today, but also uh, CEOs and directors, you should get your ticket to Fast Track on Civility in Local Government if you haven't already. That's being held on the 17th of November at the RACV Club. If you'd like to know about any of those events or to secure your tickets, head to vlga.org.au. Okay, some uh, housekeeping for you throughout the course of the session. Please feel free to add your questions for our presenters in the Q&A box, and we'll endeavour to get to them throughout the presentation or in our Q&A component at the end, if time allows. The chat function is also open for any commentary or discussion that you might like to have with other attendees. We are recording the webinar and that will be made available to all those who've registered in the next few days. And we do find a lot of people register and are unable to attend at the time, but they do that uh, in the knowledge that they'll be able to watch it back at their leisure. So let's test out the chat box. And if you could let us know where you're joining us from today as we get started with our discussion. So firstly, to introduce our speakers this evening, we're delighted to have with us Paddy Mann, the Chief Executive of Longford County Council in uh, in Ireland, in County Galway. That's where Paddy is from. He's got a background in engineering and following a period of working in construction in London and Sydney. He began his career in local government at Mayo County Council in Ireland in 1991. He's been Chief Executive of Longford County Council since July of 2017. 16. Good morning to you, Paddy. Morning from Ireland, Chris. Lovely to have you here, and we'll hear from you in just a moment. I want to say hi to Scott Waters, who's the CEO of Moreton Bay City Council in Queensland, Australia's third largest council and one of the fastest growing, in fact. He's previously been CEO at Noosa Shire Council and the City of Darwin and has a firm focus on enabling sustainable growth and development. Good evening to you, Scott. Evening, Chris. Excellent. Everyone's microphone's working so far. That's great. <laughs> Kirsten England is an experienced strategic thinker and leader with over 30 years of executive experience in the public sector and as a non-executive on a diverse range of bodies. She recently finished eight years as chief executive of the City of Bradford Metropolitan City Council. Prior to this, she was the chief executive at the City of York. She has a commitment to social justice, supporting empowered community action, healthy democratic practice and inclusive and sustainable growth. Kirsten, welcome. It's a bit of a mouthful, Chris. Anyway, hello from the north of England. Could have said a lot more, Kirsten. We did try to distill that down, but there's so much uh, that we want to talk to you about in just a little while as well. And uh, finally, but certainly not least, it's Ian Walker joining us, the Executive Director of the New Democracy Foundation in Australia, a role that he's held since 2011. The foundation works to find ways to do democracy better by giving citizens vastly extended time and access to multiple sources of information to see if they can find common ground. Ian has led over 30 trial projects at local government and state government level, including projects for state premiers on both sides of politics, with topics ranging from long-term budgeting for the $4 billion City of Melbourne financial plan to the potential for a high-level nuclear waste storage facility in South Australia. I imagine that had some challenges, as well as working internationally with the UN Democracy Fund and the OECD. Ian, good evening and welcome. And Chris. So that was all a bit of a mouthful, wasn't it? Let's take those slides away and let's get into the discussion about community engagement done well. So if everyone other than Patty could pop themselves back on mute, Patty, let's have a discussion about uh, the work that you're doing there at Longford County Council in Ireland and perhaps 
firstly, if you could set the context for us about where you are, what Longford looks like, feels like, and what your challenges are there. Yeah, you can hear me okay, Chris? Excellent. Yes, we can. Lovely. Listen, Longford is in the middle of Ireland, um, small county, not the smallest, but uh, we have a population of 46,000. So it's just to give a little bit of context to other other sort of members of the panel and, and our guests. Um, nevertheless, we're the fastest growing population. So the 2022 census pointed out that we, we had a 14% increase, which is well above the national average. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, 20% of our population would not have been born in Ireland. So we have a very diverse population as well. And, um, you know, Longford has moved really from being, you know, a small county in the middle of Ireland, you know, with a decent enough economic base to becoming a very, very diverse um, and very challenging um, area, I suppose, for a local authority to to serve, uh, lead and, and represent, which is, you know, what the council is all about. So that's that's Longford. Um, let me think. We have a very good employment base, um, good agriculture background, the River Shannon, which is the main river in Ireland flows along uh, our western sort of border and we're about an hour and 20 minutes by road or rail from from Dublin so that's that's where Longford is you know if anybody is kind of wondering where we are you you've you've been the chief executive there since 2016 i imagine it's changed a lot given that description in that time how has the way you engage that community changed over time yeah it's um it's we have a good um we have a good level since 2014 local authorities in Ireland have been formally charged with the community and enterprise development and before that we had done it in an informal way so we now have a community and enterprise uh, directors and we have you know formal and informal engagement with, with all of our communities and that has coincided with a lot of investment in rural Ireland particularly in a county like Longford which is very very rural so community engagement community led projects have been very very sort of um have been well developed in the county over the last number of years but i suppose a key sort of element of community development um, in Longford over the past two or three years has been the, the the role we were chosen as as a local authority. We were chosen as a pilot by the government along with two other um, jurisdictions to to test really a new community safety partnership, which is you know will form the basis of the new sort of how policing is managed in Ireland uh, into the future. So we have a community safety partnership in place and a community safety plan in place for just over um, a year now, and. The basis of that plan was formed through a very extensive sort of consultation um, program and a consultation plan, really, with all of our communities, particularly our new communities who were, you know, are, we were challenged to, to get to know in, a, in, a, in, a, in what was once a rural part of Ireland. Paddy, and for the audience's benefit, I've asked each of the panellists this evening to think about some engagements that they've been involved in that have gone well, and perhaps some that didn't go as well as expected, and to talk a bit about why that is. Is the Community Safety Partnership pilot program one that you put in the It Went Well column, and if so, why? Yeah, it's still a work in progress, but I believe it, it's it's gone as well as we could have expected. Um, you know, we first of all the town hall style public meetings they're important but they're not they're not the be all and end all and, and in some cases they're barriers for a large diverse population so in our case you know we'd have put together a, you know a, a plan at the start of the process involving surveys focus groups pop-up stands at events you know we have a lot of summer shows and agricultural events throughout the summer so we'd have we'd, we'd be there at the events we'd go to meet the the younger people the youth of the the county and, and turn up at events where the youth might be and try and engage, you know, and reach out as far as possible to, to all the different groups and even, you know, taking the feedback from the groups as to what are their concerns about safety, their own safety, the safety of their communities, etc. We acknowledge we're not going to capture everything. Uh, in our case, we, we, you know, we moved forward and developed a plan acknowledging that we didn't cover everything and a key point really in developing any plan was to make sure that the feedback we, rece we received, the meaningful feedback was incorporated and if it wasn't incorporated, it was acknowledged in the the various drafts of the plans. Um, we have a lot of diverse uh, community groups in the county and a lot of groups that would traditionally have a lack of respect or maybe a little bit of fear of authority. Um, people come from Eastern Europe, people come from the Middle East, people come from war torn parts of the earth and so on. And, you know, it's been a challenge to reach out and engage and I suppose gain the trust of some, some of these new community groups. Um, we've done a fair bit of work in identifying ambassadors, champions of these communities. We have, we're have we nowhere near there, by the way, but in terms of a plan, the plan was adopted uh, last year, was launched by our Minister for Justice uh, in our county buildings just over a year ago. But we acknowledge that it's, it's a work in progress and to really gain a meaningful community safety partnership that will provide the basis for safe communities in the county. We have more, more work to do to fully engage a lot of them 
the groups that would find themselves marginalised, I suppose, um, either, you know, ethnic groups from, you know, originally from Ireland or a lot of the new groups that are, are, are finding themselves living in a, as I said, a rural county in the middle of Ireland. Paddy, you mentioned policing being part of that. I, I think just uh, for, for, for context, what is the relationship of you as a local government authority with policing? Because I know in some parts of the world, it's part of a local government authority's responsibility, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and in our case, Chris, uh, unlike other local authorities across the world, we don't have a policing function and up until um, 2019 in Longford and for the previous 10 years, we had a, a joint policing committee, which effectively uh, incorporated the local council as some, you know, a, a small range of representatives from communities through the public participation network and the local police. Mm -hmm. and, and they were, you know, a good start, I suppose, in, in an area in, in terms of the local authority becoming more engaged with our communities. But nevertheless, the, our Department of Justice, um, I suppose, having reviewed the effectiveness of the JPCs, the Joint Policing Committees, decided to follow a model that was already in place in Northern Ireland, and and I expect in the in the rest of the UK too, where you know a oh. community safety partnership um, was seen as a as a model worth testing. So that's the the model that we have up and running and testing now in, in the county up for the last year. It's been reasonably successful, and I sorry yeah. not to cut across. I'll give you one small yeah. example: antisocial behaviour in a small town like Longford population 12,000. We, we wouldn't expect it to be huge, but we have a lot of, I suppose, antisocial plus criminal activities in the, you know, certain sections of the town. Um, to avoid the Halloween, so Halloween would be, um, you know, a big, big event and would lead to a lot of kind of um, antisocial behaviour over the years. To avoid that, the community, community Safety Partnership got funding to put together a, a very good sort of Halloween festival just held last week. Mm. And on, on the night itself, we had maybe 10,000 10, people in the town for a fantastic um, Halloween parade. And, and it was a really good positive event for the town, but it also kind of helped minimise or almost eliminate the antisocial activities that you would be getting normally in previous years. So, mm. you know, it's, it's 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 kind of understanding issues, working with the police, working with the agencies, um, really engaging with the communities, particularly our youth in that space to, you know, to deliver, I suppose, a safer environment for, for all of our citizens and communities. A very impressive outcome there by the sounds of it, Paddy. Tell us also about the Centre Parks Tourism Development. It's another engagement process that went well from your perspective? Yeah, um, our um, panellists and, and uh, listeners in the UK are probably familiar with Centre Parks, but Centre Parks came to Ireland um, in 2019. They came to Longford, which was a, a huge coup for us in the, in the Midlands. Um, it's a two, quarter of a billion euro investment in a holiday village really in the middle of the the woods in south longford um so such major development obviously it brought great employment but nevertheless there's always the potential for you know for for you know community sort of angst about you know major developments in in you know a pristine sort of natural area now uh, as a local authority we're charged with you know serving and leading our communities but we also have an economic um an economic role as well so you know we had to kind of kind of i suppose um support the economic development of our county along with making sure the interests of our communities weren't disregarded now having said that the the company and the their their construction teams and their planners were were excellent and throughout a very very sort of i suppose company led but supported by the local authority community engagement process the planning process was was delivered very very well and very professionally to the point that when the county council granted planning permission the option to appeal that to the, uh, in our case, on board plan all of the national planning sort of body uh, was there for anybody. Only three um, objections were raised and uh, two of those were relatively minor. And the third was, you know, an, an environmental issue that was well addressed and final permission was given within a few months. So, you know, the, the, the very proactive and very professional, um, I suppose, community engagement, community for that were held right throughout the planning process, I suppose, allowed for the community to really understand what was coming and and deal with any fears or concerns people might have had so that um you know the the the, the project got permission in 2016 it opened in 2019 it's absolutely you know a very very good success story it's employing over 1200 people it's full all year round but the, mm. the community engagement goal is ongoing you know we're in 2023 now four years after it's opened there's still regular community engagement between the the company, the local neighbourhood, and, and we, we have a role in that as well. So it's, it's it's a good story. It's how to do it well, I think, in terms of um, delivering, you know, a fantastic infrastructural sort of um, project in, as I said, in the, the heart of Ireland.
Patty, uh, we'll give you a rest. We'll come back and talk about something perhaps that didn't go as well in just a little while. I'd like to bring in Scott Waters now, the CEO at Moreton Bay City Council. And, and Scott, perhaps if you could set some context, we know you're one of the biggest councils in Australia. Um, what's it like there for a, a typical resident of Moreton Bay at the moment? Sunny day, uh, just to the north of Brisbane, uh, about 27 degrees. So not too bad, and particularly for our friends in the UK and Ireland, uh, starting to go into winter, we absolutely feel for you. Um, but look, an amazing place. Uh, we have our hinterland. Um, we have our um, a city that is a polycentric city. So we very much value um, our town centres and our CBDs that we have. Um, they are growing. Um, some of the fastest growth within the country. So we're welcoming between 12 to 14,000 new residents each year, every year. Um, that will now occur for the next 25 years on our forward population projections. Um, so we're dealing with the difficulties of growth. Um, our mayor is very clear that uh, we're about um, uh, going green as we grow. 75% of our local government area we've ensured has been protected from future development. Um, but um, even doing that, there are difficulties in ensuring that our natural beauty is maintained and um, held into the highest possible level. Um, look, we're a council um, of uh, over half a million residents. Um, we have um, our mayor, we have uh, 12 divisional councillors, uh, budget circa $860 million, um, over 2,200 staff, and we don't have responsibility for water or sewer. Um, so if we added that utility on, which uh, a lot of local authorities have, you'd start to see how, how big a council we, we really are. Um, so we're a council that um, is going places, um, but we need to manage our growth, manage it effectively. Uh, and that is all about communicating and, and talking to our community. So, Scott, in terms of some recent community engagement that's gone well for you, uh, I imagine this is going to be an easy one for you to talk to because you've just picked up some awards at the 2023 International IAP2 Australasian Core Value Awards, haven't you, for a couple of projects? Look, we have. Um, so particularly for our Environment Award, um, so for our Living Coastal Plan, extremely important um, for us to not only plan for um, our aquatic environment now, but also into the future and dealing with the issues of climate change and that we have so many um, of not just our residents, um, but um, our, our, our small cities, our townships that are built on the coast. Um, and we'll need to look at how their resilience um, is working um, towards the future um, as we see sea level rise and how that affects our planning approvals. What we do with height, um, some of the issues that we're going to be facing with a growing population is we can't continue to sprawl. So we'll need to go up. Um, so how do we do that and, and do that well? Um, and then um, Morton says, so that is our, um, our vehicle to be able to uh, listen to our community. Um, we've received great kudos in, in the way that we've been able to do that and be able to have a number of different tactics in relation to how we work with and, and, and get that information out of our community, how we bring that to our council table, but more importantly, how we now have that as part and parcel of what we do within our council reporting system um, and our community engagement team here at council. We're, we're very lucky to have a, a large team. Um, that can be agile throughout the business, but ensuring the information that we get from our community, we utilise on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so the, that broad information that's received, um, that then starts to inform council reports, which informs better decision-making from the council table and ultimately outcomes that our community are wanting to be able to see. So uh, well done, Scott. I mean, great recognition. That Morton says, I think it's called hearing the missing voices, isn't it? I imagine... Yes. Uh, a little later when we hear Ian talk about some of the principles of good engagement, I can see Ian doing a lot of nodding and writing. He might uh, uh, be able to draw some of that back to these examples. What's the journey been like at Moreton Bay? I know you've only been there since earlier in the year, but to, to get to that level of maturity of community engagement, do you think? Look, we had to invest. Uh, we had to ensure that we had a team that was solely focused on community engagement, um, not sitting um, within the marketing or the media team. We had to ensure that it was a community engagement team that is focused just on community engagement. Um, placing them within the corporate services department was extremely important for us so that they had that central point within the business, um, that they weren't sitting in external relations or another function, that first and foremost, they were able to gather 
what was occurring across the council business. Um, as a result of them understanding, they could then work with the rest of the council departments to say what the appropriate community engagement tool is, um, how we'll engage with the community, and um, then a bit of hand-holding on the different departments along the way, but uh, helping the teams from, you know, as simple as, you know, what does a footpath upgrade look like and, and how do you inform the community on that, all the way through to major pieces of infrastructure, um, different community decisions that we'll be making um, around um, the environment and other parts of what are called local government business, um, some of the investments that we need to ensure that we'll be making in the future as well. So uh, for us, it was ensuring that we could have a dedicated team that was centralised within the business um, that had the mandate and the support to be able to go out into the business and then to be a trusted partner of, of everybody within the organisation. So, Scott, we will come back and talk about perhaps some examples that come to mind for you of what perhaps didn't work as well as you would have liked. Yes. But when, yep. when we were having a, a, a pre-chat, you did talk a bit about uh, the challenges as a CEO when you've got some some different groups, uh, some louder than others, with pretty fixed views and trying to manage those tensions within engagement processes. What can you tell us about your approach there and your learnings? Yeah, look, um, it's part of the great democracy that we're all in, isn't it? That uh, everybody gets to have a say, but some have those says louder than others. Uh, look, for me, what's really important is to be able to ensure that we do bring back those tactics uh, there will always be the loudest voices in the room, um, but really understanding what our issue is. Um, and again, you know, it's you know, like a good smart city strategy. What problem are you trying to solve? What information are we wanting to receive to have a better decision being made? Uh, ultimately, our elected members are there to make those decisions, um, but they go into the community to say, hey, we want to be able to understand uh, what you say about this a, a little bit more in depth so we can ensure we make the best decision. Um, the loudest voices, I think they also need to be managed. They need to be provided with some ground rules. Um, I find that extremely important. Um, call out some of that behaviour um, that you know, isn't healthy, um, that isn't there, that's going to be for the benefit of all, um, but ultimately ensuring that everything is captured um, you know, and letting everybody know that what you say will be captured. It won't be altered. We will work through what you're talking about. Your concern is valid. Your voice is valid. Um, but however, we want to hear from our broader community base so that we can then bring that in and make a better decision. So, look, there's a few parts to that, but ultimately everybody's voice is important um, and ensuring that, um, you know, those that uh, have a bit of a quieter voice, but, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a very high degree of ownership of an issue that they get heard as well. And it's the different tactics that we use around that is what's really important. All right, Scott, thank you. There's a few things there that perhaps yeah. our audience might like to explore a little bit in questioning. So I'll just remind people to use the Q&A function or the chat box if you would like to drop some questions in there. I have been informed, panel, if you're wondering why we don't have as many people as we thought we would, uh, there's been a couple of issues tonight. One, people are having some difficulty logging into Zoom through a web browser. Apparently phones and tablets are working okay, but there appears to be a web browser issue. Uh, so that's unfortunate, but we are recording it, of course, and I, and I think there was some confusion in the UK about time zone differences too. So we might get an influx of UK guests in about half an hour. All right. Uh, I want to bring in Kirsten England now, former Chief Executive at Bradford Metropolitan District Council. Lovely to have you here, Kirsten. And perhaps if you could set some context for your eight years at uh, Bradford, what was that like and what's that community like? Well, actually, I first started working in Bradford Council in 1991, so I actually have known it over, you know, more than a 30-year period, so I've got quite a long sweep of history, but just a little bit of scene setting uh, on Bradford. So it is uh, quite the same size as Morton, I think, actually. It's uh, 560,000 people. Um, we are an immigrant city. We're a post-industrial city. We're one of the cradles of the Industrial Revolution. Um, we are the youngest city in Europe. So 30% um, of the residents of, the, of Bradford are under the age of 20, so we're hyper young, 150 languages spoken, um, the largest Pakistani heritage uh, community in the UK uh, lives in Bradford, but some of the biggest of our Eastern European uh, communities as well, which is historic from the uh, Second World War. So uh, two thirds rural, however, covering 370 uh, square kilometres, which I suspect is small in Australian standards, actually. But nonetheless, uh, two thirds rural with a big urban uh, core. And um, people might know 
of some of our kind of uh, famous kind of ancestors such well in fact some of the living celebrities such as David Hockney uh, is from uh, Bradford District and the Bronte sisters so uh, we have a kind of big tourism industry based around uh, the Brontes but uh, so a little bit of a feel for Bradford so part of what we have to work with is the energy and entrepreneurism of a very diverse community have come to make a better life for themselves and their families, sometimes one way or another, but it does give us a real vibrant kind of connected energy that is important um, mm. alongside very acute levels of deprivation, one of the most deprived places in the United Kingdom. I imagine, Kirsten, that presents some challenges in the way you engage with that community, given those elements you've described. Yeah, I mean, I, I say I've worked with Bradford for over 30 years for that reason, really, because we have had, um, not because of the size that we are, we've had devolved arrangements for engagement, design and delivery of services for over 40 years through what we call area committees, five area committees, so working with about 100,000 population down to 30 wards. And we actually have a dedicated kind of communities and neighbourhoods part of the council that is in and amongst communities supporting civil society on those areas on a daily basis. So really in there and engaged. And of course, 80, 85, 90 percent of the people who work for the council live in the Bradford district and they they aren't actually that well paid. They're paid less than the national UK average wage. They're not living in the most affluent parts. Clearly, senior execs like myself is an exception. So they are they are in and of the community. So we're trying to build that kind of ongoing relationship. But you're absolutely right um, that there are communities that are less heard, communities that are excluded. Actually, um, we have 90 councillors and 35% of them, I think, are of Pakistani heritage. So actually, there are certain communities that have become very engaged in the representative democratic process. But actually, the real thing is about the right relationship between participatory, participatory and representative democracy. Yeah, not expecting everybody to engage with those formal processes. So we have engagement processes for people around communities, geography, communities of interest and service user communities. You really have to work around all of those dimensions. Kirsten, can I just uh, just double check you for the Australian audience? You said ninety councillors. Ninety councillors. Yeah, we have. Yeah, we have ninety. Which, to be honest, is still fewer than in most European countries. But yeah, we do. We have three per ward. We have thirty wards, um, and I honestly think they work phenomenally hard. They carry huge workloads. They're very, you know, little appreciated, and they are the, the bedrock of a healthy democracy. I believe. Yes, yeah, so even as, as Bianca said in the chat, she thought she heard wrong. So uh, uh, in Australia, a typical, many, yeah. in, in, a, in Australia, a typical council could be, well, in Victoria, for example, anywhere between 7 and 11 or 13. So 90 seems mind-boggling. I'm not sure how many you've got, Scott. How many councillors at Moreton Bay? We're just on 12, Chris, 12, 12. in our mayor. So yeah. Uh, yeah, interesting, divisional councillors. So they've each got that patch, about 30,000 yeah. residents um, per councillor. So interesting. Yeah, amazing. Yes, and that's the third largest uh, council in Australia, uh, Kirsten. So sorry, I knocked you off track there. So if you could just talk to us a little bit about some engagement that's gone well for you in Bradford, what comes to mind? Okay, I've got two examples. Really. One is about tackling one of the big intractable issues of our time, which is kind of the environment. So we have recently introduced... Um, a charging clean air zone right across the Bradford district because of very toxic levels of air pollution. Um, and as you'll maybe know from following a bit of UK politics, the whole issue of ultra low emission zones has been fraught and elections have been lost and won on that. And um, actually Bradford is the car owning democracy of the United Kingdom, like America is the gun owning democracy. There are more cars per head of population than anywhere else, as far as I can tell. So we knew it was not going to be an easy thing to do. So we built the thing which was actually about citizen science, co-production, building a case based around uh, the health of young people, the health of older people, um, in, enrolling 5,000 of our young people, citizen scientists, becoming experts in air pollution, monitoring air quality, studying its impact on fetal development and on chronic levels of COPD and early death, and then mm. working with their parents and community service. I've just got a frog in my throat. That's okay. It was hugely contested. Our uh, taxi drivers were up in arms. We we identified significant amount of investment to enable their cars, um, their cabs to become compliant. 
Um, we had a very long lead in time. We had a massive community campaign, doorstep campaign, every town and city centre, young people campaign. A lot of political capital was expended, but we have now introduced it and it's going really well. And we can already see admissions to A&E actually dropping for respiratory diseases. So that for me is a fantastic example where we worked with, took the community through, and, and actually they became the champions for what otherwise could have been a very disruptive piece of change. Similarly, and it's a it's slightly different thing, but recently got a long tradition of community tension monitoring with our uh, faith leaders, with youth, uh, young people, with community leaders, with community groups. And obviously the situation in the Middle East is very real and present for people of the Bradford district. And we've had uh, significant problems in the past uh, when tensions erupt in the Middle East and, and conflict and war and we're, the images we see in the television. We are on a daily on the radar, taking soundings from our communities, from different voices, hearing things, tracking things, getting into places, involving people, creating spaces where people can talk. We use solutions, not sides as well. We've taken them into the schools. And for me, that is where um, we know because we've had riots and things, you know, you know, huge, very significant riots in 2001. We're never not on that agenda, but has our community feeling where are the issues bubbling up? Who do we be need, need to be getting alongside? Who can be part of the journey with us? So th those two things have gone uh, well, even if one mm. of them is in a real moment of difficulty for the world. Uh, just before I let you go, Kirsten, I just want to say, Ian, if you don't mind just um, holding just for a little longer, I might just get our panellists to briefly talk to an issue that hasn't gone well, and then we'll start to get into some principles with you. But Kirsten, I just want to pick up a little more on that community tension monitoring, you called it, which you're saying at the moment is happening daily. It might be just me, but I haven't heard that term used in a local government context before. Can you talk a little bit about how you do that? What's involved? Well, it is, I mean, it's a, back to Paddy's conversation. It is a partnership with the police. Uh, is a partnership through our safer we have a safer and stronger communities partnership which is actually about community relations as well as about community safety uh, we've built it since uh, 2001 which is when we had very significant um kind of riots here in the bradford district of course that was the year of 9 11 and i think you know the whole uh, geopolitics shifted dramatically at that point in time and um, and we built that approach over the years actually with our unit we have the the first peace studies department in the world is at the University of Bradford. We built it with um, their program for a peaceful city. So we've got academics involved. We've got um, community leaders involved. We've got young people involved. We've got faith leaders involved. We've got the police involved. And we come around a table where we are picking up um, what young people are hearing in their community. We're picking up what our uh, neighbourhood workers are picking up, what our wardens, our litter pickers are picking up. We're picking up what the police are seeing coming through. So we monitor it around political, economic, social, almost like the pest analysis that people do, but mm. we do it around community tensions, things that are going to impact on how people are feeling. We do it around social, we, you know, and some of it is looking at social media and chatter. Do, do you know what I mean? We become, we yeah. use, we do now use some algorithms as well as the qualitative data that we're getting from being in and with communities, but we're sharing that with communities. I think that's a critical point. This is not the surveillance state. This is doing it in and alongside communities and then determining together what the right, whether it might be community mediation between um, communities, of, you know, that might be in conflict. And um, at times it's about us making statements, uh, vigils, you know, because things that happen in the world impact in Bradford very quickly, bringing everybody together in a moment of remembrance, commemoration, thinking about what binds us together run, divides us apart. It is about the festivals that we run through the year. It is about the transparency of decision making. Do you see what I mean? I mean, bonfire mm -hmm. night. I, I know, Paddy, you mentioned Halloween. For us, bonfire night is our huge flashpoint. We can have rockets fired across roads into, you know, telephone boxes. We can have mayhem. So that's a huge community tension exercise we do every year. And that involves physically removing anything that could be a problem for us, being on the streets around, you know, working with the retailers who sell the fireworks. It's a constantly engaged process. Does that give you a bit of a feel for it? It, so that, it does. There is it, both it, a bit of science and there is a bit of art, yeah? Yeah, it's it's absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Kirsten. And and I'm, I'm just, this is the ex-CEO going, how do you resource that? Is that part of everybody's task to contribute to that monitoring or do you have dedicated resources for it? So we do have some dedicated resources. I mean, you'll be aware that, of course, the backdrop of all of this is 40% of the revenues of 
um, English local government have been removed in the last 10 years. So we are increasingly at the blue light end of activity with our children's um, and your know, protective services for adults and children. However, um, we have reinvested, we've created um, bandwidth to reinvest around some of these things in recent years, particularly as a result of COVID. We realised mm. how important it was to have the scale of resource to be in and alongside the community. Um, so it is resourced. We have um, a stronger communities team. We have a, a safer communities team. We have neighbourhood teams. We have youth service. We Many councils in England have had to abandon having a youth service. We still have youth workers, the tax youth workers. Um, so, yes, and we would fight hard to protect that. We would let other things go now because we know the consequences. When we had the riots in 2001, we had 250 young men in prison for anywhere between six months and three years, which was unheard of. Mm. And almost every family um, in certain communities was affected. So that that lives long in the memory. All right. Uh, thank you, Kirsten. Sorry to take that off uh, in, in a side direction there for a moment. It is 9-11 today too, by the way. I sort of realised as you were talking back to those, uh, those riots. Before I go to Ian, I just want each of you to please just very briefly tell us about something that you look back on and you think that as a piece of community engagement didn't go well. What was it briefly and why? Paddy, can I ask you first? Uh, before I work in I worked in Longford, I worked in Mayo, which is in the, the west, northwest of Ireland, beautiful location. Um, the uh, oil and gas company, um, I got permission from the state and from the county council to bring gas ashore and to, to refine it at a refinery in a very, very pristine part of the, the you know, a, a very sort of sparsely populated part of northwest Mayo. Five men went to jail um, in, uh, uh, as a result of contempt of court because of their objections to the proposal. Um, this proposal was going to bring employment, going to bring significant economic um, benefit to a, you know, a region that, that was really ravaged by immigration for years and years and years. But I believe that because of the, you know, the, just the poor quality engagement by the company and indeed the, the local authority, uh, mm. which, which I worked for at the time, um, a, a kind of a, an atmosphere of suspicion, fear, maybe, maybe kind of... Um, maybe not not correctly placed created uh, the conditions for a small but very powerful group of opposers to you know the big company coming in and doing what it wanted in a in a very very remote and pristine part of the country so mm. the project was stalled for years you know but when the, the the project resumed you know police had to charge locals to allow people to go in and start building the pipeline in the refinery, etc., and it it left a significant impact uh, on a community in the you know in a remote part of Ireland that I would say even today, maybe 10, 15 years later, hasn't fully been been healed. Now mm. it did bring economic benefit eventually, but it left a very very divided community. Interestingly, the one or two local politicians got involved and sided with the the, the small but powerful um, community that protested. Um, but when it came to the elections, the the the, the local um, uh, local politicians who you know, quietly sort of supported the development and supported the majority of uh, residents who weren't opposed to it. They were the guys who got re-elected. But it was, yeah. you know, it, it still has, and even today, there, there are divisions in town, villages, and even families. So uh, the role of the company, and indeed the role of the local authority was, you know, definitely a case study for how to get the community relations wrong at a very important time, you know, at, at the, the start of a major, major project. Some lessons learned there by the sounds of it. Thanks, Paddy. Yep. Scott, do you have uh, an example? Look, Chris, I do. Um, from my time at City of Darwin, so uh, Australia's front door is probably the best way to describe Darwin, the northernmost capital city in the country. Uh, we were rolling out the largest smart cities um, partnership uh, that Australia had had at that point in time. So that was um, partnering with Telstra, three levels of government, putting in a whole range of gadgets and widgets, um, all about being able to have um, a smart city ecosystem ingested through a single platform to be able to make better decisions. Sounds fantastic. Um, the issue though, facial recognition on the cameras that were installed and the community um, absolutely saying, this is something we do not want to have. Now, albeit that it is around facial recognition occurs in so many forms and, and you know, the retail environment, you name it, it, it's there. And even talking to the community about your local government, your council doesn't have a database of your face. 
So there's no ability for us to be able to utilize it, but um, you know, it's fairly standard in the technology in all of the cameras now. Um, so we went had to go through a process, um, the privacy trapdoor, I think you could call it when it comes to um, new technology coming in and, and how communities are, are rightly so, um, unsure about what government is going to do with that information and how they use that. So we had to turn that around. Um, there was a lot of um, discussion with the community, um, privacy training with our staff. We were then in a position to be able to say, well, look, as a council, you know, we will not be utilising the facial recognition component of, of these cameras. However, they are still going ahead. And if they are ever to go ahead, there's a number of categories and gates to go through, including community consultation and then ultimately a unanimous vote of the council for it ever to be activated at a point in time. Um, so we got there in the end. We're able to deliver the project. Everything went well. And what we thought was always going to be something, well, look, that's just part of what we're doing right now. And, and, and the community wanted to be able to have that safety presence. It was very much that mistrust that is still there with government, no matter where you are. Um, what is the government doing with information that we have? How are they using it? Um, what does that mean for me? Um, so a very good learning, I think, um, for me as a CEO in local government and that, you know, of always, you never assume. Um, but when you are there thinking of what is going to be the very best outcome, also think of the worst outcome. Talk to your community first. You'll find out pretty quickly. Good advice there, Scott. I think uh, Ian's nodding with approval. And just before I come to Ian, Kirsten, do you have an example of something that you look back on and uh, wish it had been done differently? I do. Um, yeah, I do. Um, in quite a different way, sort of way, really. So uh, I would reflect on the early days of community asset transfer, where we we have transferred over 100 assets. But I think in the beginning, and I, this is excruciatingly embarrassing, really, our bar was set so high that we were requiring small community groups to operate as though they were corporate organisations producing, you know, well-developed business plans and also um, take on responsibility for business uh, assets that could well be a liability. And it's not on the same scale as the two examples, Paddy and Scott, but it's really an important example for me about getting that balance right. So investing in the capacity um, of organisations to understand what taking on an asset would require and to develop the requisite skills or access them or us to kind of source them for them so they you know to basically take the view that we want this to happen so we're going to actually get alongside this community organization so that this is a success in one instance though we took so long deliberating about whether or not we were prepared to transfer an asset can i just say it fell down we had mm. to demolish it that's really oh, embarrassing. Oh. Yeah, it so was it physically, little, it physically and literally it, fell down. It collapsed. Yeah. It was yeah. in a it was in a small wood and a and a environmental organisation wanted to run horticulture from it. Children excluded from school. It would have been fantastic. In another context, we transferred quite a significant asset um, to be run for community purposes, only to find that it had started to be run as a wedding venue, largely for commercial purposes. We hadn't covenanted it sufficiently. So lots of learning there about the due diligence, getting the right balance during the time it takes, the kind of, uh, you know, how you actually work alongside people to come to the judgment that this is going to be of community benefits, what you want to happen, and you will assemble the right resources around it. Yeah, so embarrassing Excellent. examples. We're getting better, but can I just say no one ever gets this right completely. It's a continuous journey of learning. Every day is pretty much a, a, a learning day yeah. on this agenda, I think. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Kirsten. I, I noticed we've got a few people joining us, I assume, from the UK. Again, apologies, there was apparently some confusion about the start time, so we've got a few uh, bleary-eyed UK guests uh, joining us now. Um you will be able to watch this back and we've had some terrific discussion, but we've got some terrific discussion still to come because Ian, thank you for being patient. I thought it would be useful to hear all of those examples and then come to you to talk a bit about what you see as the key principles of getting engagement right. And then we can have some discussion about some examples you've been involved in. Ian Walker from the New Democracy Foundation. Thanks, Chris. And, and Kirsten, Scott, Paddy, what I'm going to say hasn't changed. I felt really bad that you had to give a bad example uh, going in and handing over. And for confession, I mean, we've had two projects go awry and the reason's always time. Um, as I looked at the topic for tonight, you know, community engagement done well. If I think about who does community engagement really well, it's the justice system. Think about the decisions that we take in the justice system. Incredible decisions to send someone to jail for 25 years 
And if you turn on the news tonight and hear that, you'll probably go, oh, I guess they did it. Whereas you can do something at a local government level that looks relatively benign and the world can blow up. And they tend to be the phone calls uh, that we get. So if there's one sentence takeaway, I'd love to ha have people, uh, you know, take away from the few minutes I've got with you. Judges find juries complimentary, so can counsellors. Now, if you look at it, it's only a broad analogy, but we look at that there's five principles for good engagement that we try to embed into any design that we do. My goal is simple. My goal is simply to reach a trusted decision knowing that there's no right answer. There's just an answer a given community looks at and says, that looks fair enough. It doesn't matter what the decision is. It matters that they're willing to stand behind it. Now, these five principles, um, I've been doing this job for long enough that you end up doing similar conversations a lot of the time. And some of you, you will be thinking, these are the five most obvious things I've ever heard. Why did I get up in the morning or why am I late for dinner right now sitting on the call? But often people get to the end of the five and go, oh, Lord, we do none of them. I want to suggest to you that they're this. Um, firstly, are you speaking to a representative sample of the community? Now, we achieve this by lottery and random sampling. Most of the time, most engagements are geared towards the two ends of the bell curve who are saying, "You council, you absolutely have to do this. Council, the world will end if you do what they want. Oof, and off it goes. Uh, an analogy with the, with the justice system. Can you imagine if it was self-selection to be on a jury? You'd get six members of the defendant's family, six members of the victim's family, and try to work out why they don't agree. So first, first principle is always look at, are you speaking to a representative sample of the community or have you built in a skew? The second principle we focus on is have people considered a diversity of sources of information? Most people offering a comment have considered one or considerably fewer sources than that. Um, social media is a giant public opinion machine. Uh, public opinion is what we think when we haven't been thinking. What, we don't want to capture what people thought in the next 10 seconds. Uh, we want people, once they've had a chance to think and actually consider the evidence. Now, if you put the two first principles together, you want to have a representative sample of the community, which is gonna be all ages, all backgrounds, um, different levels of wealth, blue collar, white collar, no collar. And you want them to consider a lot of information. You actually need considerable time. Uh, a, a lot of engagements are set really tight or offer very limited formats for thought. Um, the fourth principle, simple, it's authority. We're, we're very strong on how do you actually incent and draw out those non-usual voices. You put up in lights at the outset how you're going to respond to the decision. So in a common project, say, often at a state level, you will get a commitment that your report is public immediately because there's this mistrust that consultants, et cetera, are going to crawl over it and pull out any pieces they don't like. Um, that the government will respond in writing in full in 45 days. Uh, and then that the relevant minister, premier, councillors will meet with the group within 30 days after that. I'm trying to get a regular person to look at an invitation to participate and say, actually, that's worth my time. Authority is a huge part of that. And the fifth principle, again, in the blaringly obvious category, um, is to look at, are you asking a question that's relevant to people's lives? Um, one of my favourite, we're going to use the City of Melbourne example a, a, little, a little later on. Um, we got contacted by a CFO who said we're really struggling. Um, councillors have promised a, a series of things in the last election where as a $400 million a year council, if we do them, we're $1.22 billion overspent over the next 10 years. Uh-oh. So did they want to walk away from their promises? No. <laughs> did they want to put up rates 42%? No. And they were asking people, um, and apologies to our foreign guests, but Scott should cringe at this because we cringe as well. They were asking, how can the city of Melbourne remain the world's most livable city and continue to excel in financial sustainability? And we offered the advice that said, you know, Kim Jong-il couldn't write a better question. The question to ask is, how can we live within our means? If you think about that, that is a question that is immediately relevant to people. You've got to share a problem. Um, and then give people a free response to it. So um, 
if you look at this citizens jury or assembly methodology, we take a random sample of people, we try to get them to consider a diversity of sources and perspectives. And with that, uh, you then come to a point where generally 40, 50 hours across three or four months, and then they're tasked to find common ground around a hard question. The, the, the point I'll end on is, so what happens to all those active community groups? Turns out they quite like the chance to make their case to a group like this. I can say to any group, if I put you in front of 35 or 40 people I've picked at random, will they agree with you? I can tell you that most people think they have God on their side. So everyone accepts the invitation and it's so transparently not manipulated that, that if the decision doesn't go their way, they're like, well, I got a fair hearing. And I think that's really a key aspiration you want in community engagement. So Chris, that was the little pitch I wanted to give to just give a framework to say that there's five principles that really matter. And this is a tested method that works incredibly well. And I'm really lucky to have Patty from Ireland on because Ireland are the absolute exemplar at a national level for using citizens' assemblies. So um, okay. it's, it's a great way to make trusted decisions. Um, Patty, do you want to respond to that? Is that something that is just baked into the way you do engagement now in Ireland? Yeah, yeah, Chris, and and I mean, Ian, it's it's become more um more more the norm, I suppose, at a national level. Some major issues like climate, climate change, and climate action. There's been a citizens' assembly chaired by a you know by a I suppose a respected person. There's been a most more recently a citizens' assembly on drugs, and that that's been chaired by a former chief executive of of uh, one of the Dublin local authorities and. You know that's that's kind of allowed the the type of participation and the type of you know representative sample of the you know the the, the country really rather than the community in, in our mm. case to look at um issues of national national importance um and, and and other kind of contentious areas where in the past you know we'd have had you know severe divisions and and probably you know um uh, kind of an inertia in terms of developing, you know, real, real kind of um supports and real services for for the for the people. Yeah, and it's 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 got buy-in, and the most not the most recent, but um the the prospect of a directly elected mayor for Dublin, which kind of is formed by three four different local authorities, again has been through the citizens assembly process, mm -hmm. and a number of recommendations come out of that, and ultimately it's up to the national party or parliament, sorry, to you know to legislate on that. But the the by and large, the parliament has been very found it very easy to legislate hmm. in areas like climate change, directly elected mayor, and and the challenge now is in the drugs area because that's only just recently, but it has been you know very much informed and guided by the outcomes of the the citizens assemblies. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that, Ian. Thanks, Patty. I, I might just prompt the audience if you've got questions for the Q and A. We are moving into the home stretch, so uh, please pop those questions into the Q and A box or the chat boxes if, if there's something you'd like to ask our panellists. So Ian, coming back to you, as you were describing all of that, I, I might ask a question on behalf of some of the people I know in the audience who are from small, not terribly well-resourced councils. Do, don't you need to have really uh, a lot of resources to be able to do all of what you just described? I describe principles. The models can range from, candidly, we can do this in documents, all the way up to, look, the, the nuclear project ran about 5.2 million. Hmm. So... But if you think about it, just apply these principles. Um, I know that there was a great engagement, and this is some years ago, it wasn't us. National Parks and Wildlife in New South Wales, there's a problem with wild horses. Now think about this, it's, it's contentious what you do with any uh, animal control issue. They did a document-based consultation. So they, in, instead of just doing the standard 12 page, this is what we're doing, they did something different. They only did two pages themselves, and they gave space to 10 different sources. Like there are environmentalists who uh, want to control the horses to protect the environment. There are people who look at the impact on water. There are obviously people in animal conservation. There are farmers' perspectives, bushwalkers. They gave the different perspectives space in a document. Write a page to make your case. They distributed it to a random representative sample. They asked them to dwell on a series of very focused questions that pointed them at those sources and what they didn't, what they trusted. What I'm trying to point to is you can have a deliberative engagement in a five, what, what is a five thousand dollar format. Um, mm. It's about Im embedding the principles and getting away from many engagement professionals love large numbers. Large numbers are a false god. I would rather take a representative sample of people 
who's generally representative and get a chance to think because they've got the incentive to think because they're being listened to. And you can execute that in a very small, simple way uh, at a rural council. Uh, it's funny you say that. I was just reading something today where someone was being critical of a council's decision saying, you know, there was only like 60 responses and, you know, how can that be representative of the council? I know it's uh, it, it, it's more problematic than that. We've got 76 senators. No one ever turns mm. on the news and goes, my God, why aren't there more of them? Yeah, yeah very true. <laughs> very true, Ian. But do you need a burning platform, uh, like a crisis, to be able to put those principles into action generally in terms of, you know, the the, the citizens, juries, assemblies, et cetera? No, uh, the, the general starting point is people of, um, the people who contact us are generally, what am I getting out of my community engagement? I'm getting a lot of, well, you would say that. I'm hearing from the same pool of people and there are decisions that we keep kicking down the road because they're a little bit ugly. Um, that doesn't need to be a crisis. These are simple principles, but I would say for all councils, I remember the first time starting out in this job, it was a local mayor. Uh, for those watching from Australia, it is Angelo Tarekas who got done by the Corruption Commission today. Today, yes. So iconic closing of the loop. And when I said to him, what's hard in local government, he looked at me and said, are you stupid? Here are my revenues. Here are my costs. And I have 90,000 people outside wanting everything more and better. That's my problem. Um, and our first project asked 35 people in Canada Bay what range and level of services are we prepared to pay for? And I remember the mayor said to me, he said, you won't get 35 people turn up here for six Saturdays to discuss that. You have no prospect of that working. We said, Ange you know, Angelo, here's the equation. If it doesn't work, you point at us, a research charity backed by former premiers. And if it does work, enjoy the dividend. Um, and, and as a little postscript, particularly for those in elected office, um, the 2011 state election in New South Wales was the most one-sided election, I think, in any Western country. Um, the local government elections followed immediately afterwards. Um, out of 150 local government areas in New South Wales and 92 directly elected mayors, there was a swing to the Liberal Party in all but one. He was the only mayor who increased his margin. And he called me the Sunday after and said, no one understands what you guys do but they see people just like them making decisions and they like it. Somehow I got to balance a budget and get more popular. And I think that's this, we have a lot of empathy for people in elected office. We're trying to make your job easier because the greatest political asset is regular people standing behind you going, we've looked at this in detail and that's fair enough. If your community engagement isn't generating that, self-selection is great for agenda setting and, and hearing about problems people have. But when it comes to, to recommendations and trade-offs and hard decisions, we'd really encourage people to think about those principles. Ian, when we were talking, uh, you you mentioned the process at the city of Greater Geelong, which went through some some crises of, of democratic representation. Uh, what were the learnings or the observations from that process that you were involved in? Briefly, so for the, for the benefit of people who aren't familiar, I think Geelong Council, what is it, about once every 10 years, I think they've been dismissed by the Victorian Parliament. And uh, under under municipal monitors at the moment, in fact. Again? Oh, yeah. no. Yeah. Um, I think that's still a bit of a carryover. Um, in essence, the, the council had been fired. It is an extremely contentious, difficult area because within that local government area, you have the intersection of state and federal seats. So it gets it becomes a bit of a political football, mm. what to do. Um, the, I think that the interesting lesson for this call is when we were contacted by local government Victoria... They were planning a plebiscite of everyone in the area to ask, you know, what was the way forward? And they had done a poll and they said 78% uh, of people in Geelong want to retain single member wards. We said, that's fantastic. Did you ask them what single member wards are? People will just answer a question that you put in front of them. Mm -hmm. We suggested to them to run a values-based survey using Vote Compass. Um, 2,000 people were surveyed and simply asked, in order for you to trust your local councillor, what's the most important trait? It was just a 10-item list that you could pick through. Someone with a job like me, someone with a background like me, someone about my age, so on and so forth. What came last? Someone who lives near me, which is the basis for the single member ward system. It wasn't important when you asked, if you're going to do opinion uh, engagement, do it around values, 
not around a recommendation or an outcome. What was interesting to us in that is that the uh, a group chosen at random from the community actually found it quite close whether they preferred a directly elected mayor or councillor elected mayor. They settled on the councillor elected mayor format because they wanted people to work together. They said directly elected mayor is interesting to us, but look at the results it's generating because you end up with this endless conflict. Um, I think the real takeaway, the local government minister, the Labor Party, did not have the numbers in the upper house. There was a bit of contentious around this because of the other factors I mentioned. 35 of those people travelled from Geelong to, to Melbourne, where Parliament is about 100 kilometres, and met with crossbench members of the upper house. And the members of the upper house, I remember it, some of them started leaving quite early, so my heart rate was up. And they said, these people have clearly thought about it, and this is clearly not rigged. This is, you know, tradies, dentists, childcare workers, this is all over the map that they can talk to it, they're informed and they've found common ground, why would we stand in the way of that? I just think when we're looking at what's the filter for a trusted decision, are we acting on the informed common ground will of the people? This is a good way to get there. Thanks, Ian. Interesting, those comments on on the directly elected mayor model, which didn't last very long in Geelong. We see it, uh, I think, increasing in New South Wales at the moment, and Patty's already mentioned it coming in in parts of uh, the UK. Um Last call for questions in the Q&A, and I do understand that people in the UK, many have only just joined us because of the confusion with the time zone. I might just quickly go to each of our panellists for any reflections after Ian's talked about those principles. Do you see those principles reflected in how you're operating now, or is there still room for improvement? Perhaps, Kirsten, if I could start with you. No, I recognise those principles, and I would say we don't get it right all the time. You know, that's a really good kind of mirror to hold up to say, in everything we are doing, are those things evident? What I would probably just say is absolutely citizens, juries have played their play and do play their part in the way we reach decisions. We are also kind of in the space of community collaboration and co-production. So it's almost instead of seeing it as citizen and state, seeing it as the creation of a team in which we're all bringing something an energy, a talent, a resource in with which to regenerate our place. So that daily work of community well-being and regeneration is kind of the end of the spectrum that we are really heading towards. Do you see what I mean? But yeah. absolutely, those principles still apply in that process. Um, but I just want to kind of, we're trying to push a bit further so that it's about creation of a movement, a community of people trying to make a place better to live in. Thanks, Kirsten. Scott, any thoughts or reflections? Uh, absolutely. Look, what, what Ian said resonates so well. Um, for, for me, um, it really comes down to understanding the sentiment of your community um, and um, those uh, the bell curve um, will have everybody on either side of the spectrum, but it is, it is a sensible centre at the end of the day that we really need to be able to, you know, for the ordinary person in the street, what does this mean to you? Um, and um, how can we make it better for you? Well, what can we do better? Ask those questions and uh, the community will respond. Um, and no, the noisy side of the bell curve will always be there, have the principles in place. So uh, yeah, it definitely resonates and um, you know, very, very well points made. Thanks, Scott. And, and Patty, any uh, reflective thoughts from you? Yeah, I, I was busy writing down um, uh, when, when Ian was speaking there because I can recognise uh, some of those principles are probably already in place, and maybe not in a formal way, but definitely they're 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 very useful guides. And, and we in Longford, along with all of our colleagues uh, in other local authorities in Ireland, are are embarking on the the climate um action journey now, and we are about to publish our climate action plan, which we have to have adopted by the end of February twenty twenty four, along with all of the other thirty local authorities in the Republic of Ireland. Um, which will see us delivering on our targets, you know, uh, under a legal sort of uh, bind in terms of in reduced emissions, increased energy efficiency. But the biggest challenge for us, because we, we only make up maybe two or three percent of the, 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 the carbon sort of footprint for our county. But our real challenge is to bring our communities with us, our businesses. Um, and we, we are going to kind of enter in a significant community engagement now and into the future so that individuals, groups, and 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 the businesses can and will deliver, you know, in terms of um their their own their own yeah. carbon and and climate climate sort of um commitments, I suppose, so that, that the whole country can achieve its targets. And we have a very national uh, ambitious national climate action plan, 
with significant targets and we're talking about net zero by 2050 and so on. I'm not sure how that compares with others, but we have a, a green sort of element to our co coalition government that is really is driving the climate agenda and really driving those local authorities to show leadership uh, to our community. So like those principles, um, Ian, you know, I'm, I'm going to make sure they're, they're, they're in place and applied as we, we enter this. And it's, it's probably the most important journey we're on, I would say, um, as a local authority and as, as a as a country, you know, um, now and into the future, we've we've had three storms already. This well, not even in the winter yet. We've had um significant um rainfall in our part of the Europe, but a huge drought in the rest of Europe over the summer. You know, we're we're experiencing it as is everybody else. So, uh, you know, I think bringing our communities with us is going to be you know the the real challenge. Um, local authorities have put the hand up to say we lead in this. You know, and the state has has acknowledged those, and we we've been given the 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 charge really to to. to deliver our, you know, prepare our plans and deliver and bring our communities with us. So, you know, great, great huge benefit to me, actually, to um, listen to you in there. Oh, if I may, Chris, yeah. but you mentioned twice, bring our communities with us. Yeah. And I, I often love this. And, and for anyone watching, you can try this out straight after this call. Um, most of us don't like to be told what to do. So try telling your partner, you need to go to the dentist. This will not go well. Um, <laughs> particularly for you, Kirsten, you know, blokes are worse, et cetera. Um, but if I ask you, how do you plan to have teeth when you're 80? You go, oh, should floss, should I, I should actually book the dentist. Asking an yeah. open question that reveals the problem will probably help you get to the solution faster than putting up and saying, here's my plan, and then letting everyone hit you. Um, uh, it's, it's a cheeky example, but it does, the more we ask people simply to solve the problem, rather than try to sell them the problem, is where we've seen a bit of a transformational effect. Completely agree with that. That kind of bringing the communities with us implies we know where we need to go. We just need other people to to work that out too. Whereas let's create the journey together. Yeah. So uh, Anna's asked the question about uh, wanting each of you to sum up the number one thing for making community engagement work. I, I think you've done that uh, as well as talked about some of the largest challenges in achieving that. And we are just about out of time. So I would like to just come back to each of you to thank you very much for your uh, contribution. Patty Mann in Longford County Council. Thank you, uh, Patty, for your uh, insights tonight and all the best with your projects, particularly that climate action plan. Kirsten England, who is uh, at Bradford, just recently stepped down, I think. Uh, so what are you doing with yourself now, Kirsten? Uh, well, actually, I'm working for my professional body, representing chief execs who are in difficulty with their employer. That's one thing. <laughs> I'm also I'm chairing the delivery company for the UK City of Culture Year in 2025. So Bradford will be the UK's City of Culture in 2025, and I chair a national think tank. So I'm I'm not quiet. I've also got grandchildren. So there you go. <laughs> Excellent. All the best with that, Kirsten. As we said when we caught up, there's never a shortage of things to put an ex-local government CEO to work on, given the broad skills you develop do, uh, doing that role for a number of years. And Scott, thank you very much to you. Scott Waters, CEO at Moreton Bay City Council. I know you're very early in your journey there at Moreton, but you've got some big challenges there to address, I'm sure, to keep you busy. Great opportunities, right? They're not challenges, they're opportunities. Yep. Looking forward to them. Well said. Thank you, Scott. And Ian Walker from the New Democracy Foundation. I think everybody's been furiously taking notes and you might expect a phone call or two after this session. Ian, thank you very much for sharing that with us. Thanks for the conversation. Good to have you here. And thank you to our uh, audience for being with us uh, tonight for community engagement done well. And we've even thrown in a few community engagements done not so well, perhaps for the purpose of uh, learning some lessons there this evening. Don't forget that the program has been recorded and everyone who's registered will receive a link in due course so that you can watch that back at your leisure, which is just as well because we have had some issues on the Australian side with uh, Zoom um, challenges tonight and on the UK side with confusion around the time. Might be best that we're wrapping the program up for this year and we'll all go away and uh, take a good hard look at ourselves and come back and uh, get it all right in 2024. If you'd like to speak to us any further about any of the issues tonight, drop a note in the chat before you go and someone from the team will reach out to you. As I said, that's our final VLGA LGIU panel for 20. 23. Keep an eye out for the topics and dates for 2024 coming to you very soon. Just leaves me to say thank you and good night to you all. Bye for now. <music>